I am really thrilled to be here. This is the first time I have seen this facility uh, since it was an open space. And so this is something that uh, we at Babson have been imagining and working on now for over four years. Uh, this is now my, my fourth year at Babson as president and the first thing uh, that I needed to take care of when I first came into that office was to figure out are we moving forward with this project or not? And one of the most critical things that I had in my mind was do we have the right partners? And once I met Fad and learned about Imar's absolute dedication to this idea and, and what a critical role uh, the college that now is the Mohammed bin Salman College would play in the life of people in cake, I was sold that this was the right place to be and absolutely thrilled to be moving forward. We've received great support uh, from the government of Saudi Arabia. We're deeply grateful for that and also deeply grateful for their vision in terms of the need for investment in higher education and also for investment in the future of job creators. And so what we're going to talk about today is how Babson and how Mohammed bin Salman College is going to be the generator uh, here uh, in Saudi Arabia for job creators among the younger generation. So right here, uh, I have part of the mission statement for Mohammed bin Salman College that emphasizes its alignment with Vision 2030. And also, you will see in a moment how very closely in aligned it is with Babson's own mission. We believe at Babson that we can create entrepreneurial leaders. Now, a lot of people think that entrepreneurs are born, not made, but we believe that we can educate young people who want to be entrepreneurs how to do that. And we want to do it in a particular way. We do it slightly differently than other business colleges. And what we focus on is that we would like them to be pursuing something that we call the triple bottom line. We want them to make a profit, we want them to care about how that profit impacts the people who work there, the people in the community, the people around the world. And we also want them to think about how that product and their operations impact the planet. And I believe that companies that do that are going to be more profitable than companies that don't do that in the future, that this is the modern approach to business education and you're going to have it right here in this building. And I'm so excited to see this classroom. It's going to start right here. So you might ask, how does Babson College uh, educate entrepreneurial leaders? What is our process that makes us different? We've been ranked number one by US News and World Report for over 20 years now. Uh, we actually came up with the idea, as I mentioned, that you could teach entrepreneurship, that it wasn't something that was just a gift from God that you were born with, that you could develop it. Some people are certainly more talented than others, naturally, but there are always gaps. You know, you often ask, why do so many entrepreneurs fail? I think it's because people have gaps in their knowledge, gaps in their skills, we try to fill that in. One of the things that we do, and one of the things that you're going to be doing here when you have the undergraduate program open, is to have what we call the fundamentals of entrepreneurship, uh, fund fund fundamentals of management and entrepreneurship. So when our students come to us, and we have a class of a little bit over 500 students a year, we divide them into small groups. It's the only class that every student at Babson must take. And we divide them into groups, and they're very um, diverse groups. We have over 80 nationalities uh, represented on campus. We have great diversity among our American students as well. And so these are students who really don't know very much about each other, about each other's cultures, about each other's habits. They can't make assumptions <clears throat> about working with each other in the way that you might elsewhere. Uh, elsewhere. And one of the reasons why we do this is we want to simulate what it would be like to be a global leader, someone who had to work across cultures and understand the assumptions of other cultures, not just your own. And we tell these students that they have to go through a design uh, process in their minds. They have to 
think of what kind of product would they like to sell, why, what kind of problem are they trying to solve, and, and how would they do that. And so they go through this process of iterating uh, various ideas until they come up with what's something that they think could be successful, and, and then they, they run it. Um, they run it from about January to April. We're in the midst of it right now on campus, so everyone is running around trying to sell something. And then we make them close it down. And the reason why we make them close it down is because most businesses fail. Most early businesses fail. So we don't want anyone to get out of Babson College without having failed or at least to see what it would look like to fail. And trust me, we don't have to push many of them very far. We give them about $3,000, uh, so they can't lose very much, but many of them do lose it. Uh, and, and if they do make a profit, they give that profit to charity after paying back the loan. So why do we do it? First of all, we want to remove the mystery of starting a business. We make them incorporate. We make them open bank accounts. We make them pay payroll. We make them do all the things that, that business people have to do. We don't want them to be doing anything for the first time when they start their own business. And we also want to make sure that they understand how important their curriculum is. We make them do this before they've had accounting. We make them do this before they've studied management or marketing. They are truly uneducated when they are doing this, and they are going to make every mistake imaginable. And then, when they take those classes, which they are simultaneously trying to take, some of these classes, they suddenly say, oh, that's really interesting, because I wish I'd known that, because I wouldn't have lost all the money, or I wouldn't have made this error, or I wouldn't have alienated this person in the way that I did had I actually had that knowledge. So it engages our students in their, in their studies in a way that they wouldn't otherwise. And ultimately, it builds their confidence. It makes them know that there's nothing really very complicated about this. It's a process. They can do it. And that's critically important. Let's see if I can get this to go. There we go. Um, so how do we do this? How do we do that uh, design thinking process? We ask our students to look around them and see problems, see frustrations in their own lives, to see problems that you see other people experiencing, or maybe really large problems that we're experiencing in the world. We actually educate our students about the UN Global Development Goals, because that's a pretty good sum summary of all the things that are wrong in the world. You know, if, if you look at the Global Development Goals, they are trying to correct every single thing that's wrong in the world. And so if you have our students looking at those things, they're going to be thinking a little bit more broadly. And then we ask them to, to take those, those problems and, and look at them instead as opportunities. Now, as you're going to see in a few slides, people in Saudi are great at seeing opportunities very good at seeing opportunities, and that should make you very optimistic about the future of the country. So, because that's the hardest, that's the hardest part. Most people stop at seeing the problems, and they can never translate those problems into potential opportunities. And then the next piece is, is turning that actually into a business idea that generates profit and that takes care of other issues, as I mentioned before, the people who are involved and the impact on the planet. So here are some of the most interesting things that we found out recently. Babson has been engaged for over the last 20 years in a research project called the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor. And what we do is we go to different countries around the world. We engage with other universities, and now we are engaging with the Mohammed bin Salman College in this research for the region. And we ask them the same questions every year. So we get good longitudinal data over time about how attitudes and practices are changing around entrepreneurship. And these are some of the things that really stood out for us about Saudi Arabia. So two-thirds of the people here believe that starting a business is a good career choice. Imagine that. Now, you know, I'm sure that Fad can tell you, because he's compared the Saudi statistics to every other country in the world, that this is not common. In many, many countries, many of the Asian countries where I was just visiting recently, very few people thought, less than 10% thought that starting a new business was a good thing to be doing. And even more important, 
see good opportunities all around them. And that's probably why they're optimistic about whether or not starting a business is a good idea. And almost, you know, over a quarter of the people are thinking of starting a new business in the next three years. And the other piece that's fascinating, but it makes sense, is that there isn't much fear of failure in Saudi society. And I think that's something you should really think about. Because you may feel that, that you or others have some fear of failure, but I can tell you that this is a very good statistic, that only 42% of people here would actually make a different decision about whether to start a business because they're afraid of failing. And that is critically important. If that, if that were higher, I would say there was no hope for having an entrepreneurial culture. But you have lots of hope. And the, the most fascinating thing for me is that even now, 92% of your entrepreneurs are opportunity driven. So what does that mean? If we were in a poorer country, or a country with fewer opportunities, you might have just as many entrepreneurs but they would be driven by necessity. They would be working because the alternative is starvation or unemployment. And so the idea that already 92% of the people who are out there in, in, in Saudi society are seeing opportunities and acting on them, again, gives us real hope that this is uh, at core an entrepreneurial society and that you'll be able to move forward in the way that you'd like to. And what we're also seeing is that there is great optimism about job growth. And, and not just small amounts of job growth. You know, it's, it's extraordinary, 40% of the people who are uh, engaged in entrepreneurship actually believe that they're going to create more than six jobs you know, in, in the next few years. So, so this, is, this is optimistic. We're, we're very excited about these, these numbers. And, and moving forward, we're gonna be able to track this every year and, and see how things go. Now, as many of the speakers at the conference this morning were noting, 99% uh, of the businesses here are small and medium-sized enterprises. But in fact, they, they don't actually contribute as much to the economy as you'd imagine that they could. And the other thing that they don't contribute is as much to the labor force as they could in terms of an employment. And one of the things that we have been doing at, at Bamson, which I'm really excited about trying to bring to Saudi Arabia in one form or another, is a project that we did with the Goldman Sachs Foundation called the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Businesses Program. And you can look at this as a giant pilot project that we did in the US. Uh, again, Bamson professors created a curriculum that did three very simple things. First of all, they provided basic business skills, nothing very complicated, just basic accounting, basic management, basic marketing, all the things, all the skills that you, you might hope that you would have if you were a small business owner. Secondly, we placed them in a cohort, in a diverse cohort of people who they might be able to rely on in their community. We connected them to mentors in their community. We tried to make sure that they felt supported and mentored. And then finally, we educated financial institutions uh, around what it means to loan to a small or a medium-sized business and how you might recognize a good small or medium-sized business to loan to. And then we went back as part of this first part, part of the practical piece, and said to these companies, and these were selected because they were stable, small businesses. They had been around for at least three years they had a certain amount of sales, a certain amount of income, somewhere between half a million and three million dollars. And they had at least three employees. And we said to them, what would it look like to grow? And most of them were not thinking about growing. They were just thinking about surviving, not going downhill. You know, growing was not on their agenda. But we said, you are going to make a plan to grow, and a plan to grow that you could take to a bank, or a lender, or a VC, and grow. And they did. And they did. It was extraordinary what happened in a very short period of time. So in just six months' time, 80% of them were making more money. 60% were creating new jobs. Some were creating many jobs. And 
found that those that collaborated with each other, and there was an, an, a great deal of collaboration within these groups that was completely unexpected. This wasn't part of our model. We weren't trying to get them to connect other than just in a, in a fraternal sort of way, just in a, you know, we're all in this together sort of way, but they started doing business with each other, and it actually worked out very well for them. And then we're also finding out that these individuals are so grateful that they are now mentoring other small businesses in their communities. And the way that we did this was something that could be done anywhere. Oops, let's get back. Um, what we did is we took our professors who wrote the curriculum and took them out to community colleges which are two-year colleges in the US for students who probably don't have very strong educations and are usually from lower socioeconomic backgrounds. And we selected businesses from those areas that were really economically depressed and brought them into this environment. And then we taught those professors who aren't the best professors in the world in many cases, but they are in some cases. And we taught them uh, to teach our curriculum and we stood by them and mentored them. And now, after we leave, they're going to continue doing it. They can do this on their own. So this is a model that could be taken anywhere. This is a model that can spur the creation of job growth in small and medium-sized enterprises. It's been proven. It's been tried out. We've got the statistics. We're now over two years out on our first cohort. And we just see it building. And we see the impact in the communities where it's been. So we would like to take this to as many places as we possibly can to build it out in ways that it can be useful in other countries. And we think that this fundamental approach is simple and replicable and very effective. And then I don't know how many of you were in the last session, but this was my last point there. Saudi Arabia has an extraordinary opportunity to increase their GDP and to increase, increase their employment simply by doing a better job of engaging women. Right now, four out of 10 entrepreneurs are already women in, uh, in Saudi Arabia. Think about that. Four out of 10 already. So this is good. This is a good trend. But think how much more value you could create if men and women were engaged at a similar level. So this is the low-hanging fruit. This is the easy part. If you want to get a burst of uh, energy in your economy, figure out how to help women entrepreneurs enter the market and succeed. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll end, say thank you, and open it up for questions. Thank you very much. Any questions? Yes. Sure, thank you for coming here. And I liked your presentation a lot. Just a question about sustainability. To sustain entrepreneurs, what is the best advice you can give them after their first year? And they, we can give them the jump start, the in-kind support, but after that, how do they sustain themselves? I think the kind of networks that we saw emerging from the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Businesses Program are really critical to that. And we also see that different types of incubators are helpful to s different types of entrepreneurs at different stages of their careers. So for example, we have something called the Women Innovating Now uh, uh, Incubator, the Win Lab. And again, this is something I would love to bring here. But what we find is that actually women entrepreneurs have different needs um, than men entrepreneurs initially and that they also behave differently towards each other than, than uh, male entrepreneurs. When, if you go into a, an incubator with, a, a, with usually predominantly male entrepreneurs, it's a very competitive environment, and honestly, they'd like to see each other fail. It's going to make them feel better if they see each other fail. And within the, the women's incubator, it's going to make them feel better if they see each other succeed. And they're there to support each other and learn from each other, and it's a much more collaborative process. We find that after women have gone through that, they can compete very well in the other environment, and it's no problem. But both of those experiences are things that can provide support for early stage entrepreneurs. We also talk a lot about how important it is to recognize that whatever you start out doing may not be and probably won't be what you end up doing. That you need to pivot before you hit the wall. 
and that a smart entrepreneur doesn't drive something into the ground simply because it's not working. They learn from that experience and, and make the gradual changes necessary to find something that does work. And so if we can work with early stage entrepreneurs to understand that, that probably that first business plan that they wrote, that first idea they had, is not gonna be what they end up with. And that that isn't failure, that's smart. That's where you need to go. I think that can help people survive that early stage. Just following up on yes. that question, do you believe university startups have a better sort of strength than, than just the normal startups? Because, thank you. Do you believe university startups are more impactful in the community than just normal startups? Or do the universities co provide a com continuous support to them? Does that have an effect on them in terms of their success rates? Uh, well, I, I do think the, the support does have an impact, but I think the training does too. And so again, hearkening back to what we found in the 10,000 Small Business Project, um, there are lots of successful businesses out in the community that you can work with, but they're probably missing one or two or more components that are holding them back from growing and scaling. And so education for entrepreneurs is critical. Um, and, and I think that you can't start early enough one of the things that I'm really harping on these days is that I believe that entrepreneurship should be a court co course taught in all high schools, that we need to start earlier. So, so that people get that entrepreneurial mindset so that they're not expecting that at the end of education, someone's gonna be offering them a job, they're going to be thinking, how can I create opportunities for myself? And in all of these cultures across the world, and there's many, where the bulk of the population is under 30, that spirit of I can take care of myself, I can create my own opportunities, is absolutely critical to not only economic su success, but political stability. Yeah. Yes? Um, I have a general question. And, uh, mm -hmm. I was reading an article and also I'm following one guy on uh, Twitter. He <laughs> okay. says 90% of the American exports are from the small and medium businesses. Mm -hmm. And the value of these are $435 billion, which basically 29% of, of the total export of US economy, mm -hmm. which I love this thing. That's why it's saved in my phone. <laughs> so in this statement, in this matter, what I'm trying to do here, um, would you have a plan to support um, the people around those small businesses. The small businesses are existing in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem is running these businesses. Mm -hmm. The percent that I saw about the fairness, which yeah. I think I'm one of them, <laughs> um, is well, basically- 40% are, yes. I think it's uh, 42, right? Yeah. 46%. Yeah. There you go. Oh, nope, no, that's not more. it. No, no. We'll get there. Yes, but it was 42%. Yeah, previously, yes, right. in a brief slide. Yes. Help me, please. Is it, I'm, not, I'm not getting any response right here. Here okay. it is, yes. Okay, there you go. Thank the you. The only 24% feels constrained for the feel of mm -hmm. uh, failure. Mm -hmm. um, my question is, I believe um, the support around the small business are not existing. Mm -hmm. So would you have a plan to, as you said, uh, to help um, I don't know, ministries or other field to support these yeah. small businesses in terms of, you know, the documentation, mm -hmm. all of paperwork that the, the, the small business has to go through mm -hmm. and uh, all of this. And uh, I, I saw this improvement in one program. It's called Shark Tank. Mm -hmm. It's in, it came in ABC, yes. I think, or ABS. Shark Tank. And, uh, yes, I it's, it's a show this. that uh, our, our students love to watch. Yes. Exactly. Yes. So I always watch this show and I saw how potential are these you know, the guys who give money and who make opportunity and changes on those small businesses and they make, they double, treble their uh, revenue mm -hmm. just because they have connections and they have, you know, sort of support for these small yeah. businesses. So, so this is what I want. No, I, I, I understand the question. I think that uh, part of what we need to talk about as a, as a culture here is the need for government to make it easier for small businesses to operate. Regulation actually has a very important part part to play. Um, in the US, for example, uh, it's been determined that small business people have to spend four hours a week just doing government paperwork. Four hours a week. So if you're a sole proprietor, if you're trying to launch a business, imagine 
what that does. And it probably doesn't come in a neat four hours you know, on Friday every week. It's probably a week-long thing that you need to do when you're filing various uh, paperwork or when you're doing various payrolls. So um, we, we aren't uh, the best example uh, for Saudi Arabia to follow necessarily, but I think that it's critically important that the government understand, uh, understands that there is a role for them to play in terms of making it easier to establish businesses and also educating lenders and encouraging lenders to support small and medium-sized businesses that aren't really usually the clients that, that most banks and lenders want to take on because they don't understand what's a, they, they, they're in so many different areas, it's hard to understand which of these opportunities is the best. And so there is a role for government there to educate the lenders or to be the lender of last resort to support these, these kinds of businesses. It's also smart though that lenders or the government would require that small and medium sized businesses go through some kind of training program to make sure that they have the fundamental skills necessary to succeed before they get that funding. Because it's very easy to have one small flaw in your knowledge and have that be the demise of your business. So I, I think that uh, you're, you're, you're correct that, that there are things that need to happen, not just here, but probably almost everywhere, to support these small and medium-sized businesses. But as a former politician, I can tell you that you, you, politicians spend a lot of time trying to recruit large companies that may bring 100 or 1,000 jobs or 2,000 jobs if you're very lucky. But if you could just get all of your small and medium-sized businesses, those 99% of your businesses in the country, to add one job each, you'd have full employment. So it's, it's much easier to think about how do you support that sector than how do you create those new big industries. Thanks. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Um, through your presentation, and obviously in Saudi Arabia where the population is predominantly under 30, we, we're generally talking about entrepreneurship as, as a youth-driven thing, as, as a young person's game. You look at the United States, you look at Europe, you look at the UK, because we're not part of Europe anymore, um, and uh, they moved you it. see they that back. there is a significant challenge for people kind of my generation in terms of um, inability to support yourself in retirement, the, this ne necessity of your working mm -hmm. life to continue, and yet your employability is going down as you get older. Right. I'm wondering what, how the dynamic changes for entrepreneurs coming into entrepreneurship towards the end of their corporate careers. Mm -hmm. does, it, does the mindset change? Do the, do the ways that people look at it change? Do you, do you train them differently? Because you know these people are coming with Gen X mindsets, not millennial mindsets. It's yeah. a fundamentally different kind of person. We've done a little bit of research around this, and, and interestingly, the groups that we look at are former professional athletes, because we get them sort of mid-career when they have been, you know, in a, in a career that's not sustainable, uh, and the NFL actually uh, comes to Babson and has ha asked us to create a curriculum to help those kinds of mid-career pivots and to help people regain their confidence when they actually feel that the skills that they have are no longer useful. Um, and so I, I can imagine that those kinds of skills that, that we've developed for working with uh, you know, giant football players. We, uh, you can always tell when they're on campus because they're, they're way bigger than everybody else and it's, uh, it's quite fun to have them around. Uh, but I'm sure that the skills that they need to acquire are very similar to the skills that any job changer needs later in life. Um, so I can, I can see that that would be an opportunity as well. Yeah. Other question? Yes? I'll wait. Okay. Thank you. So uh, you mentioned that education is obviously very important for entrepreneurship and you provide the entrepreneurial education, but that has a cost. So how do you motivate an eager entrepreneur or eager wannabe entrepreneur who has an idea, wanna, wants to launch it, mm -hmm. to sort of now invest more time and money and go into education first mm -hmm. and maybe delay his idea, maybe completely forgo his idea or just basically to you know invest the money into the education instead of bootstrapping his business and his idea now. Mm -hmm. So so this is I think again where the government can can come into play 
Um, what, what we did with the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Businesses Program is we devised a program that met on weekends and that had online components and that you would be given a skill uh, when you're together over the weekend and the assignment was to apply that skill in your business during the week and then come back and, and check in. How did that go? Is that part of your business okay? Okay, here's the next skill. Try that one out. And so our, our goal was not to take them out of their businesses, but to make sure that they could do that checkup as they were going along. I also think online education has a huge role to play here. So uh, Babson just put up our first series of entrepreneurship courses on the platform called edX. Um, and we have our introdu introduction to, uh, to entrepreneurship and we're going to do a series of six. I think the first three are up at this point. Um, and within the first three hours of the first course going up, uh, there were more than 5,000 people signed up for it around the world. Uh, so I think that there is a hunger for that kind of information. And uh, part of the project that we still haven't completed here uh, with, uh, with Amar and with Lockheed Martin is the creation of something that we called a virtual venture uh, accelerator, which would be an online tutorial uh, where you might be able to get some of the co same kind of information that you would get had you the time and the money to take time out and go to an undergraduate program or a business program or a program like the 10,000 Small Businesses Program. So uh, we're hoping that we will be able to move forward on that and that's something that we're talking uh, about right now. But I think there are online resources for those, those folks. Certainly, look at edX. How many of you are familiar with edX? It's, it, it's a platform that was created by Harvard and MIT. They've sunk about $65 million into its development, so it's a very robust online uh, platform. And uh, different colleges from around the world put uh, MOOCs on them, you know, so these massive open online courses, they're free. Uh, and some of them you can get a certificate at the end if you'd like to, but uh, there's no obligation to do so. You can just take the course and see where it goes. Yep. Yes. Maybe for people uh, who are watching online, it's better. Hello. Okay, so I have a question. A um, few slides ago, you mentioned that um, entrepreneurship can be taught through um, the program that you mentioned in Babson or the ba uh, or the other program that Goldman Sachs helped with. So my question is, <coughs> when mm -hmm. going to another country or to a whole new culture, do you have to localize the program? Do you have to add the yeah. ingredient of the culture in the program? Or yeah. is it like a fixed formula that works everywhere? I, I think you do have to localize it. And, and that's what we're trying to do here at the Mohammed bin Salman College. We are not trying to completely transplant everything. Uh, about our curriculum at Babson, although in some ways I think our curriculum is a little bit more transferable because we do have 82 countries represented on campus. We do try to have a global uh, curriculum, but there are always going to be specific aspects of every culture that, that need to be accommodated or accounted for. And uh, one thing I would say uh, here in, in Saudi is that you're going to have to think about what it's going to mean as many of the government-run entities are privatized. You know, how is that mindset going to impact people? And what's it going to be like to retain your job when you are now in a public-private partnership? I think those kinds of, uh, of uh, questions are going to emerge. How do you become an innovator inside a company, uh, if your job is one that is internal, you can still use entrepreneurial thought and action to be a problem solver, to be a leader within the company. And so I think those are the kinds of skills that are going to have to be emphasized. We talk a lot about that entrepreneurship is more than just starting a business. Entrepreneurship is really a way of thinking and acting, and you can do it inside government, you can do it inside a corporation, you can do it as, as a startup, you could do it in a nonprofit. It's just a way of conducting yourself so that you are a creative problem solver and you're creating value. Yeah, yeah. Yes. 
What do you think is much better to persuade a new opportunity or to help an existing business which is stuck for the last 10 years? I guess it would depend on the opportunity and the business. <laughs> of course, of course. But I mean, with the new opportunities, more of like digital business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, more investment and a new investment to an industry which is, uh, um, for myself, I don't have any experience with that. Mm -hmm. But I have a little experience with my existing uh, business, family business mm -hmm. at least. But what I see is that it's not going anywhere and there is no potential business for it, except for some extraordinary uh, innovation. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so this is, a, this is actually a question that many of our students have. So we have approximately 40% international students, and of those, 90% come from business families around the world. And so their question is usually that. You know, do I start something new? You know, I have all the tools now to be an entrepreneur, or do I go back and try to innovate within my family business? And I would say that every generation of entrepreneurs in a, or in every generation in a family business needs an entrepreneur or it's not going to survive beyond that generation. It will be broken up in some way or another. But if you have that entrepreneurial person in that next generation, they can change the, the course of that company, maybe through um, new technology maybe simply through you know, recognizing an entirely new opportunity. There might be a way that you could take your new idea that you want to do and tell your family, sell the business, let's do this new idea. That's the future, maybe. But you have to be able to inspire confidence uh, in, in your family, in the leaders of your family, that your ideas are good and that you have the skills necessary to do it. And one of the things that makes us happiest or makes me happiest is when I meet parents who have had their, their uh, son or daughter come back to the family business and have them be totally disruptive, you know, and, and you're making them automate things, making them go off into new branches, making them change the way they do everything, literally just battering their poor father or uncle to death. And, and yet somehow the, the, the patriarch is so pleased because it has taken the company to the next level and that they trusted you know, they're, they're the next generation. So hopefully you can succeed in that. Okay. I have a question, Dr. Yes. Kelly. Like we see in product life cycle, there are different stages. We have introduction, we have growth, maturity, and decline. And then people have to, what Nokia missed basically, and Apple took over from there, they did, could not diversify and could not put right strategies in, in place. Do you have some, something similar at each stage strategy, like if you map it to the socioeconomic pattern of a country? Every stage, like a starting a budding entrepreneur, then you have a mature entrepreneur, then somebody which has plateaued over a period of time and some businesses that are declining. Do you have strategies or do you have courses or curriculum according to these phases of uh, business development? You know, I actually can't answer that question. I, I, I don't know if we have courses that focus on that specifically. Uh, I do know that we talk a great deal about needing a specific type of leadership for each of those stages. And that I've often heard uh, people who serve on boards of directors, for example, say that the founder has the skills necessary for the startup stage, but you must leave the founder behind. Uh, as that company goes to scale because they often don't have the skills necessary to, to take it forward. And then when it levels off and finds its, its, its sort of static level, that that person who wants to scale is going to be so bored that they will not want to stay with the company. And so that you do have to plan uh, about having different types of leadership uh, over the course of that arc. I don't know that it's been applied to countries overall, whether you can, you can do that, uh, but it's a, it's a question I'll go home and ask. For instance, I mean, just an extension of that, if you may allow me. You have a person who's doing uh, conventional technology business over a period of time, but it's the time that he wants to venture, or he should venture into digital technology. Would there be some support system, some program that could be applied in the society, other than customizing the business, or according to the country, probably need to some strategy which is, which is built in to promote the business, to take the business in a different arena. Would there be some sort of program applied here as well? 
Um, I don't know whether there are programs like that uh, planned here, but certainly our professors at Babson do uh, do already address those kinds of issues, those kinds of transitions. And perhaps that's a question for one of the faculty who's uh, who, who's here already. We only have a small bit of the faculty in place so far for the Mohammed bin Salman College, but they're very impressive. So, would would a member of the faculty like to tackle that? Not yet. Okay. Yeah. I think the answer is to be to be determined. But that but thank you for this suggestion. If you can if you can just can we hear the question again, please? The question again. Mm -hmm. Which question I passed to this question? Uh, the second one. Yes. Uh, my my question was that, you know, since we are talking about customizing the program according to the country, mm -hmm. do we have something where, you know, a conventional business can be taken into a different level, to a different level? by in, inculcating some changes into that, you know, and of course we are talking about SMEs, mm -hmm. where there is more change required and where probably more education and training is required. Mm -hmm. Would there be a plan that Babson or Mohammed bin Salman College would mm -hmm. be indulging in to create that kind of awareness or education or training, mm -hmm. in, in, you know, so to speak? Well, I think you've just given us a very good idea. Um, I do know that there is a, um, uh, there's a funder who we've been talking to uh, who has uh, a, a technology company and his particular interest is helping minority businesses in the US uh, transform their businesses through the use of new technology. Uh, so I think that that's very much uh, along the same lines and we may learn through that process. Thank you. Ah, okay, Dr. Pablo. Uh, I wasn't planning to hijack your presentation. I'm Please, sorry. I, I, I invited it. I Thank invited the, the, the hijack. The answer is very simple. We have two, uh, well, many branches, but one is executive education. In that part, we actually help uh, firms with their own specific needs. But as far as the degree programs, we, uh, we are not only about creating a firm, we're also about developing a firm. So you can, for example, if you work in a family firm and you want to grow that firm, that is part of what we do and we call entrepreneurship. So remember that entrepreneurship is more about entrepreneurial leadership, is the capacity to transform and to adapt something into the new reality. So to answer specifically your question, yes, of, of course, it is in, incorporated into the MBA, it will be incorporated into the undergrad in the future, and the idea is that the program fits to the needs of the student, not the other way around. Uh, of course, we're going, this, this program is not for everybody, but the, the type of students we're going to accept are a type of students who precisely have this entrepreneurial drive and want to transform, as uh, it was said before, transform by creating a firm, transform by making a firm grow, tr by transforming a family firm, in the social sector with social entrepreneurship, but also in the government. So I think the answer is, is yes, I'll be happy to give you more information after this, uh, the presentation. Can you identify yourself too, for everyone? Well, Dr. Steve. It's Dr. Steve. <laughs> No, actually, maybe I'm not um, uh, the most appropriate professor to answer this question, but I'm professor in uh, finance. So um, I think up to some stage, old entrepreneur uh, business becomes a problem of uh, finance, a, a, pro a problem of the money management or capital management. So by providing some uh, consulting service, I think we can uh, help uh, uh, small business entrepreneur in this region. Right down here, please. Thank you for being here. This is Walana Haas. Right. Uh, actually, my point is uh, the importance of being part as Babson uh, or uh, as uh, 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 Mohammed bin Salman College, part of a community, which is Amar or Cake, to support cities around, starting from Rabagh to Thuwal and Jeddah and across Saudi. Uh, people are expecting a lot of having Cake around. Mm -hmm. and expecting more of, I'm sorry, Fahad, uh, yeah. yani, um, I'm pushing, but uh, people really are, are, and we think that part of the solution that uh, uh, the college might uh, focus to solve mm -hmm. would be around local issues. And therefore, I think part, very important part would be the research uh, the very dedicated research around to understand, and therefore people around uh, Cake would, or, or around the university or with the college would feel that there is an added value mm -hmm. of, of, 
of the college being here. Yes. Thank you. So, so one of the wonderful things about the uh, arrangement that we have with Lockheed Martin and Amar is that uh, as part of that agreement, there is a permanent center here, which is a Babson Center called the, the, Babs, uh, the Babson Global Center for Entrepreneurial Leadership. And they have a, a budget for research every year. We are looking forward to creating Saudi-specific and Saudi-focused case, uh, cases that can be used both at the Mohammed bin Salman College, but also at, ba at Babson College. To, to support um, our understanding of the region. And so we are really excited about that. And one of the first examples of the kind of research that we're doing was joining the GEM uh, research network, but there will be a lot of research done around family business. This is something that is going to be one of the, the top priorities for Babson College uh, moving forward because we believe that family businesses are the essence of entrepreneurship. They were, you know, they have a founder, they have a legacy. As I said, they only perpetuate if there's a, a continuing amount of entrepreneurship. So uh, we, we intend to engage in that kind of research and also the um, charter uh, of that particular center is to do research and to do education work like you were talking about, executive education, um, that impacts the region, but, but primarily uh, the local region. Okay. And if I may add, we, uh, our professor have already started writing cases on local entrepreneurs. It has started already. Uh, of course, and we and we are looking forward to partnering with you on those and making sure that they can be you know used everywhere. Yes. yes. Assalamu alaikum and good afternoon. Uh, regarding the supply chain management, mm -hmm. are we are going to have some sessions regard that in this uh, in this uh, certificate or so this education, plus our small and uh, medium market is uh, mm -hmm. uh, facing. Uh, a real problem, which I can uh, just focus on that and say that the main problem is the of the information flow between the all the medium and small enterprise market. Mm -hmm. This is making our market is random till now. So we have to organize that from now. Planning is the prior thing than to execute the thing mm -hmm. or to execute the plan. So the planning and putting the strategies becomes uh, comes from the quality concepts in the first uh, place, like uh, quality assurance and putting the procedures and policies, then the quality control going to execute that and uh, audit that to, to let the business cycle is going uh, to achieve the last goal of all the organization, which is the biggest one, which is the kingdom at the end. So we have to all go to or, or all small goals have to uh, integrate it together to achieve the largest goal. So my question is here that there is a return on investment studies. There is a uh, quality management studies. There is ERP business models. Mm -hmm. And there is a uh, business plans which uh, 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 study the cost and the profit and study the ability and the market demand. Mm -hmm. Those all has to be focused also or uh, took a place in this uh, education sector actually, actually for meanwhile because the global business is going to open on, on, on themselves yeah, at the end. Mm -hmm. Sorry for my uh, simple English. Hey. No, no, gosh, it's much better than my Arabic, isn't it? Yeah, so yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you know, you, I, I'm grateful, yeah. yeah. So I am concerning about the supply chain management. Once mm -hmm. I receive yeah. this concept, I believe that this concept is necessary needed in our companies, or it was a small business or large one, to, in, to ensure that our business cycle is going good and the uh, cash flow which is coming back also is going to be retained in the production line and give us a new production and creative and new business trends outside. Well, I think, again, I'm going to have to, uh, to defer to the, the, the local uh, luminaries here. Um, has Dhruv Graywall brought his uh, Supply Chain Management Institute in contact with Mohammed bin Salman College yet? Yes.
effective, uh, it's clear that effective logistics and supply chain management is vital for any modern economy. The other three being finance, entrepreneurship, and marketing. Now, of course, this depends on the wealth of the students because are the students who take the electives, but we are conscious of the importance of supply chain management, improving it in particular for the efficiencies of the kingdom. Yeah. Yes, and if that's something that is of particular interest or concern uh, here in Saudi Arabia, as it sounds like it is, um, that would be the kind of program that we would be able to bring from Babson to the, the, the Babson Global Center for Entrepreneurial Leadership to do some executive education courses or some other you know, shorter term courses uh, because we do have an entire center based uh, around supply chain management uh, at Babson and it's one of our more prolific and um, I think effective uh, groups on campus. So thanks. So that was the last question. Oh, th thank you. There you go. Much. Okay. Th thank you all very <laughs> much for coming. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for guessing that's what you're doing.